Hi, so I'm, I'm Daniela, I'm a co-founder of Gotenna. Um, I should say up front that I've never worked in hardware before I started this company, and I never started a company. So uh, lots, lots of learnings. Um, to start, you know, um, I was slotted here under, sorry that the proportions are off of my slides, but um, to start, what is Gotenna? We've developed this device that connects to your smartphone, allows you to turn it into an off-grid communication tool. So I came up with the idea during Sandy when all towers were out and power was out so you didn't have Wi-Fi either, and I thought there should be a way to leverage the phones everyone already has on them to communicate no matter what. And of course, the, you know, the use cases go beyond emergency, but that's where we started. And I like showing where we are now, and if you could see the whole product, it's actually pretty sleek and nice. Um, we started in a very rudimentary fashion. Uh, this was you know, the, the idea written on paper, and the first five months of the company basically involved validating whether the technology would work, um, whether anyone wanted it, and whether anyone had done it. And the answer, luckily for us, was yes, yes, and no. Um, we, after uh, five months, we had our first working prototypes, as Eric was talking about, literally duct taped together, but they really, really worked, uh, which was really exciting. And the first uh, year of the, co uh, the company was self-funded, and we worked through various iterations of prototypes, and what I quickly learned as I hemorrhaged my own money <laughs> into the company is that starting a tech company is incredibly expensive. I'd been working in tech startups always on the software side for six years, but I'd never worked on the hardware side, and I would say that starting a hardware company is particularly expensive. Um, so even though I do really recommend bootstrapping for as long as possible, the truth is uh, you will eventually, unless you're either very lucky or independently wealthy, have to go out and find funding. And so this is, I'm so sorry about this, but yeah, so the things that I learned about the funding process is that getting funding for hardware is much harder than software. Um, not sure why, um, presumably because most people are used to investing in software. Also, I think, you know, they think the entire supply chain is kind of scary. Um, but there are a few things that I think helped us get in the door. Number one was obviously having a working prototype. Um, and the other was that we were completely dedicated to it. We'd spent already a year developing and really advancing the technology, testing and whatnot. Um, so that really showed we had both time and money in the game from our end. Uh, an IP position is also really helpful to get funded. Um, it shows that you've done your diligence. Like, what about what you're doing is potentially novel. It doesn't mean you have to walk in with patents, because that takes a lot of money and time. But we walked in with provisionals that showed we'd uh, done a prior art search, and we had a good understanding of what we were doing was new and potentially you know, could lead to full patents later. Um, the other thing, too, about VCs is that you basically end up marrying them. So if you don't like them, don't take money from them, even if they're trying to give it to you. And there's also two different kinds of money, and I think it's nice to have a mix of them. One is I call smart money, is people who can offer real strategic value. So for someone like me who'd never uh, worked with you know, a physical product before, it was really important to bring on investors who'd done a lot of manufacturing and understood uh, regulatory issues and patents. Um, but you don't want everyone to be giving you advice all the time, because because then you're gonna, you know, it's just too many cooks in the kitchen, it's really hard to execute, so it's nice to get a mix of different kind of investors. Um, so, let me see. Um, the other thing, too, is to raise a little more than you think you need. Uh, you won't be, even though I definitely thought for a while we'd be the only st hard up, uh, hardware startup to do everything on time and on budget, uh, raise a little more, but don't raise too much more, because then you'll definitely remove optionality for what success for your company might be like if you take too much money up front. <laughs> Um, and so I feel like my job at the company as the CEO and the non-engineer, um, most of all, is how do we make, make sure the money, the money lasts us and gets us to where we need to go? And I would say that the general thesis of what I want to talk about is focus. And um, there's a few points to that. One is 100% to stick to the minimum viable product. With Gotenna specifically, for instance, we could have enabled you to not just uh, share your location and text people when you're... When, when you're off-grid or don't have service. We could have also enabled phone calls and sharing videos and images, but what we really wanted to stick to was what people were telling us through tests and everything were, was the most essential features they wanted, and you know, that'll save you money in the long run. Uh, number two is to remember you're not an island. I think when you know, we got all that money and it was so exciting, um, I thought, okay, now, now we need to go hire all the best people. But what I realized really quickly is that you can get more for less from, say, an industrial design firm, you get seven people who can help you on everything from packaging to mechanical engineering as opposed to hiring one person in a house who can't do all that work. And so we've ended up doing that for industrial design. Uh, the supply chain, uh, we have an incredible supply chain manager helping us um, with that. And also some non-essential engineering that is not core to our product, we've also outsourced, which, is, uh, which has been really helpful. 
the other thing, too, is to hire thoughtfully and potentially even slowly. Of course, if you're outsourcing certain things, that helps. But um, you know, certainly, I'm always excited by anyone who's into what we're doing. And so I definitely hired a couple people who were, you know, I'm so excited about Gotenna, I want to work with you. And I didn't really listen to my gut and like looking at the resume, oh, this person's never had a full-time job, has always been a freelancer, or this person has always been an academic. And you know, uh, that's two specific uh, hires that you know we had to lose along the way. One is getting his PhD and the other one's back to freelancing. So um, hiring and, and firing is no fun. <laughs> or you know, people quitting, but um, we're now like a really small group of six people, all of whom, you know, we work so intimately with each other, everyone has to be really committed, and sometimes there's red flags early on that you know, I learned to now watch for. Um, the other thing too is I've been, I was at the beginning really, really cheap with money, even as we, you know, because I'd funded it for so long and I'd spent so much of my own money getting this off the ground, once we had money I was like, this has to last forever. This is the most money I've ever seen in a bank account ever. Um, but you know, even though I think it was really helpful to work out of co-working spaces and out of hack spaces and use uh, equipment elsewhere, the truth is at some point sooner or later you're going to have to invest in, ha in having all that stuff in-house. That's why, after all, people have given you money. So you stop running it like a family business and you start running it like a company that you know, can really operate fully. Uh, the other thing I learned is that China isn't always the answer. And what was really exciting and fascinating to learn is that we did a full supply chain model. And while we'd always assumed we were going to go to Shenzhen to produce our product, we learned really quickly that um, Mexico was only marginally more expensive than producing in China. And there were so many other things that were so much better. I can be there in four hours. I personally speak Spanish, so that's really helpful. Uh, NAFTA means that when I bring the products back into the US for distribution, I don't pay any duties. And and so in the end, China was actually cheaper for us. And we looked at everything. We looked at Singapore, Vietnam, there's a variety of things. And that's why, you know, another goes back to my previous point. I'm really glad that we brought on a supply chain manager to help us look through these things. Otherwise, we definitely would have defaulted to China. Um, and the other thing is, while time is money, and it really is, because you do want to get to market soon, you do want to bring revenues in soon, which is an exciting thing about hardware, that you would almost inherently have a business model, as opposed to so many of the other software startups I've worked at previously, uh, the worst thing you can do is rush. And again, as a non-engineering person, I'm always trying, you know, like this is something I've had to learn, which is that we are making something out of nothing. And so you can set aggressive deadlines, and you should, but ultimately, things are going to exist and work when they can exist and work. And you can't rush that development. And this is actually a photo. Look, they look like bombs because this photo, um, the color's a little off. But those were actually our first uh, test units that we were about to send out to people in October. And I was so focused on getting these things out the door and getting them out because this, you know, this timeline, I have this Gantt chart, we need to meet everything. And literally, I think an hour before I was going to walk out to FedEx to mail these to people all over the world, we found out that they were completely buggy. And so that was a complete waste of time, energy, um, emotional, and, and otherwise. And you know, so that was probably one of the most expensive things, um, mistakes I ever made. Um, so launch. We just launched two months ago. Uh, so I have a lot of thoughts about that, but I would say that, you know, and, and the gentleman prior to me talked about this, that there are a few things that made it clear that we were ready for launch. One is that we do risk technical development, which is to say everything was basically done. You know, maybe some tweaking along the margins for design for manufacturer, but we'd already passed that review as well. So that's one thing. The other thing is we had a relationship in place with our contract manufacturer, so we had a really good idea of what the cost of goods would be. So we could set a price. Um, and set a price not just for a pre-order campaign, but potentially for relationships with retailers and everything moving forward. Um, so, you know, we decided to do a pre-order on our own website as opposed to using a crowdfunding uh, platform, mostly because in many ways, um, I have to thank uh, sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo for validating the fact that people are willing to, you know, uh, support a, you know, a company or a project um, before the product is actually available. But we just thought we'd like to vertically integrate everything so we could collect all the data. Um, we didn't really want to have a timed campaign. And, um, and so we ended up doing it on our own website, which was really cool. We didn't have to you know, have a middleman involved. Um, I do think that investing in PR is a really good idea. At first, to be honest, I thought it was BS and it would be really, really wasted money. But um, we found a really incredible PR firm that was able to get us in front of a few really key uh, reporters. Uh, you know, you can't demo for everyone. And when you're pre-ordering, everyone's sort of taking a chance on you, if not entirely taking a chance on you. But um, with the right PR firm behind you, you can demo to a few key people who can validate that what you're doing works, is interesting, useful. And that was really, really helpful for us. And it's really um, served to you know, sort of be the bullhorn, which has 
help with some of the stuff we've, we've been doing since launch, which is um, you know, engaging with people on social media and definitely using remarketing as social ads. It's just made us like more, more present in, in people's minds, which has helped us maintain growth even after you know, the exuberance of launch. The other thing that I've really learned from other hardware startups, which I've been watching, is that so many people tend to over-promise and under-deliver. So without naming names, there's been a couple products that you know, have not launched, even though people pre-ordered and paid for them, if not months, years ago. And so what we've really been focused on doing is making sure that when we launched, we were really clear about when we could deliver and make sure that we weren't um, over-promising where we were in development. Um, I have seen a few hardware startups uh, launch their product when they haven't de-risked the whole technology and then it doesn't exist or they haven't considered certain regulatory issues. But um, what we're trying to do is be really honest and transparent about where, where we are um, so that you know more people will talk about us and hopefully when they uh, receive their product they'll be really happy as opposed to sort of just satiated. Um, you know, uh, the, you know, there was the graph up earlier here about the fairy, fairy tale of, uh, of startups, and I really like this one. I think this one's developed, for, I found it somewhere on the internet, uh, for software startups, but this, it, it's not really so much a fairy tale. Um, you start with total pre-launch obscurity, and you're working forever, hoping maybe somebody in the world wants w what we're doing. If you're lucky, as we were, you know, you'll have some, a really great bump in sales and attention when you launch, and then you'll go through uh, what I love, it's called trough, the trough of despair, uh, when you know, things get real. You're, you're no longer um, you know, being written about on a daily basis uh, many times a day. Uh, and I would say that we are here. We're, we've made it out of the trough of despair, and we're starting to see some, some um, steady, respectable, pretty exciting growth, which is really exciting. And um, you know, I was told to talk about my experience, and. I, and I wanted to show this to, just to show how much more we still need to do. You know, we've just started. We've just started cutting metal, so the manufacturing process just began. We're just looking into, uh, starting to look into non-dilutive sources of funding, like um, like grants from the government, because there's so many public applications of what we're doing. And you know, all of which is to say, it's really exciting, really stressful, um, but potentially super rewarding. So, um, yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs>